Okay, we, we are going to start now. Uh, sorry. Uh, well, thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to talk today about table formats, that is this new concept somehow that is uh, revolutionary. It's a new revolution for the big data world somehow, and that has direct impact for people working in, in well, data analysis and machine learning. Uh, first, I forgot to put open table formats because what makes sense uh, for this conference, of course, is that they are open. No? Uh, I'm Ismael, I work for Microsoft. Don't worry, this is not at all vendor paid talk or whatever, so in terms of being transparent. Um, I'm using a Mac, just to, to check. I'm using a Mac, this is the new Microsoft, so everything's good. Uh, just a little story about myself. Uh, I'm that, I, I used to work as a data engineer like for three, almost four years. Then I switched to work as an open source engineer and mostly working in Apache projects, all these Apache big data projects. In particular, I was working in Apache Avro and Apache Beam. Uh, if some of you have complained about uh, Avro not being backwards compatible and hate deck maintainers, well, it's not my fault, but I am complice of this. Uh, I'm also a member of the Apache Server Foundation, which means that I care about open source and all the way we do stuff on Apache. And now I work as a data advocate for Microsoft because life changes and you got a family, you know? You need money. Um, so let's talk about, uh, uh, about the eternal problem of data engineering, no? We, and this is historical, we always have this idea, oh, we have so many data sources in our company, or that we want to integrate, and, and they are quite varied from databases to Excel files to CSVs, and even now to this kind of SaaS vendors who control also data, even we can also count GraphQL kind of things too. And we want to co integrate all of this inside of a centralized repository for data, let's call this a data warehouse, uh, as they call it in the past, and it's still coming all the time. And we have this separation of what we call operational data, that is the data we use for the, to operate our application, let's say somehow, the ones who make the business, and the analytical data, that is the data we want to analyze, and we don't want to touch the operational side because this is critical for the business, so we want to move all this data somehow into this data warehouse. So, uh, well, data warehouses were somehow uh, an issue that was solved decades ago because, uh, well, that, that's what they sold at the time. Uh, and this is, uh, well, the, the, this had some issues. In particular, it was too SQL-oriented, I would say. Uh, so it has some constraints. Uh, and, and biggest constraint, of course, was that it was really vendor-centric also. And, well, the, the, the performance of, of your jobs and everything depended also in the design decisions that the vendors did at the time. And when you wanted to scale, well, it was quite costly. So there was some pushback uh, against those systems, let's say. Uh, but uh, at the time already, these systems store the data somehow. They have this kind of private file format for this. And they were really supported by other vendors. That's what differs from today, this, from this talk, let's say. And they were, of course, they were tied to the design of the database or the data warehouse, so they model things in a really particular way that was not, uh, and, and of, you rarely knew how this was designed. You couldn't access the data, see the raw data, and do things with this data. And everything changed because of this big data revolution, and this is the infamous MapReduce paper. And here we care about two things, uh, or, or they cared, Google at the time. One is how do we how can we parallelize computations to make it faster? And how can we store data distributed in multiple machines now? Uh, those those of, the, of this task, well, a part of the programming model, of course, that is part of this paper, were showed in the context of examples that are not really SQLable, let's say, somehow. These were the early days of uh, big machine learning, let's say, not Big, uh, big in the sense of distributed data. Uh, but there were tasks like cal calculating counts and making this page rank algorithm of Google that were part of this and that you cannot do easily with SQL. So this showed that, well, SQL was not the only way to do stuff. Uh, and of course, Google presented their fi distributed file system that the, in, in a paper, and the idea is the same. We, can, we, we want to store data and process this data as fast as we can. Um, 
this uh, is somehow the origin of the, what we call cloud object stores, no? and the origin of the so-called -how data lake. Uh, so cloud object stores, and this all credit for Amazon who made them popular with S3, uh, are just really good. I mean, like, let's, let's be honest, uh, well, they are not open in the sense that, uh, but they are really easy to use, they just have a key value model, and they have this durability and availability guarantees that are pretty amazing. You just see just S3 has 99.99s of durability, which is pretty impressive. Uh, they are the original serverless thing. I mean, like, who cares about servers when you, when you use S3? Nobody. And they are cheap, and I, I do the quotes here, because, well, as most of you probably know, they are, they are cheap to put data into. They are a little bit more expensive if you want to get the data out. Uh, and of course, they were really supported rapidly by all the different projects, and open source projects, and, and so they have a massive support in the ecosystem. And they have a lot of little nice extras like multi-region replication, and they have control for permissions. You can program events when they, they tar when files are written. There are a lot of nice things. So, so it was kind of natural that database applications or, or applications oriented to data were going to end up putting the data inside of this. Uh, sort of distributed file system. No? Um, and with this uh, ability to put data in, in this distributed file system, what came was that uh, the mindset started to change. And it started to change in the sense that, wait, we can have copies of our data for cheap, and, and we can somehow think that they, we have infinite space to do everything. So why we don't keep them as they are? You know? Why we don't keep these copies and we start to work more in this concept of immutability? Uh, with the advantage that, well, with immutability, we can reproduce the things because we can go back, no? Uh, this is the pa paper about Pat Helen that, that, that is really interesting, right, if you, if you care about these things. Or if you want a more familiar kind of presentation, this is Rich Hickey, who does all these closure presentations, who also has a talk where he mentions the impact of this new way of thinking about uh, data. Like, just think we have infinite data and the consequences of, of that. Uh, but of course, well, when we have this kind of data lake concept, well, we think we can put files inside of, of the data lake, and that will do it. But the true story is that, well, uh, it's, it's not so easy, no? Uh, as m many of you probably have lived it, the first thing, when we have data in a format that is not structured or, or with a scheme associated to it, is that we have to fix this. Somehow we have to give it a schema, we have to clean it, we have to normalize the, 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 the different columns. This is inevitable, so there's a little bit of, uh, I wouldn't say a lie, but it's not so free, unstructured as, as we want. Of course, the advantage is that we can have uh, other type of formats there. We can have images, we can have sound, video, whatever. Uh, and of course, logs, that is also something that we use a lot for analysis. Uh, so this idea that let's put our raw files and everything will work, uh, well, it's not so easy for two reasons. Well, first one, because the files we use to do this kind of analysis or, or um, machine learning algorithms, sometimes are not fit for distributed systems. And one example about CSV, for example, is a file that, um, is a file format that has the advantage that is, is, is row oriented, so we can code the file in, in, in pieces and maybe send different parts of the file to different machines, which is good. But, well, it's not efficient in the sense that it's not encoded in a proper way, it's textual, so it's super big. Uh, it does not have an associated schema, so you are always uh, trying to assume, oh, this column is like a date, but maybe not, and maybe this column is just uh, just an, in, an enum, but you don't know. So, so, and the other thing, well, the, the SQL is pretty non-standard, and if some of you, some of you has, have had the painful task of implementing just a CSV parser, you will see that there are many, many exceptions. Uh, other formats are even worse, I mean, like JSON or XML, but the problem with those are that a part of being verbose, is that you cannot code them in the middle, you cannot split those formats. And, and if you think about just serialization formats for your language, let's say like Java serialization or Pickle in, in the case of Python, uh, they don't pass the test also because sometimes those, those are not consistent between versions of the language, which means that you can store maybe this serialized object in the, in the file system or in the cloud object store, and then you, can, you take it back, but since you change it versions, uh, it won't work. Uh, so, 
so this brings us to the creation of data formats for, for this problem. And this is basically the first task here was, OK, we, we need to define a, a schema for this data. So let's define which type corresponds to which column. We need to guarantee that we can split uh, this also, or partition it, as they call it also. Uh, and well, we, of, of course, we have to have a really well-defined specification for this. Uh, we have to, if possible, compress the data, so we have uh, less, we use less storage. And of course, we, have, we want it to be efficient. So that's, that's what happened with this first generation of, of formats, let's say. Uh, and, and these formats, well, I, I, here I'm, I'm showing the, the, um, how, what, how it works in practice. As you can see, the, the representation of a table there uh, with the ABC columns and the data types that correspond to each, each column. If you serialize this in a row layout, well, you have something like this that is, makes kind of immediate sense. And this is what uh, Avro does, for example. So this is what Avro is useful for. And then there are more recent formats like Orc or Parquet, that is probably the most popular one now, uh, that, they that store the data as columns. Well, they, it's more complex than this. They store row groups, and inside the row groups there are the columns. But what is interesting is that if you only care about one or, or two of these columns, well, you don't need to read all the others. So you can jump with pointers inside of the implementation and, and let's say, offsets or pointers to, to, to the specific parts that you care. So this makes reading faster, no? And what we care on in all this distributed data stuff, what we care is to read the less we can. That's our goal, no? We don't want to read more because it's too costly. And a part of this, uh, uh, this, this, um, let's say, uh, columnar representation, one thing that we also store are statistics. And when I call the statistics, for example, they can store things like the mean value or the max value. And, it is, and this is pretty cool, because I, I won't even need to go and get the data. I can just immediately get, ah, oh, this is the, mi the minimum value. So that's also good for, for querying. So we, we, we had these formats. We have this, these files. But we still don't have, a, let's say, a SQL-like representation. So in, at the time, the, it appeared a, pro, a project called Hive that was the first one that bring this concept of, OK, we, with these files, we can represent a table somehow. So, so it's what I call data warehouse at, uh, for, for large data sets. And, and it's, it's totally oriented to a SQL uh, experience. Uh, this, this is the appearance of the concept of table format explicitly. And as you can see, what we are defining is just an external table. And we set up the compression we are using. And we set up the type of files that we are using, in this case, Parquet. And we set a location. In this case, well, I'm, I'm, I'm using the location for, for a, um, for, for one of these object stores, in this case, is this is the, the Microsoft one. Uh, and, and OK, that's, that's how it is. So we put files inside of a directory, and we read them. So what's a table format is the question. Well, a table format is a way to present all the files that compose a data set as if they were a single table. That's what we're trying to do. Uh, the way that Hive does it is with a directory. And as you can see here, well, the, the layout is just a directory, and we, we just list the directory and get the files. What is the issue of that? Well, that this can be slow for some particular cases. We, if we, for example, want to filter stuff, and like in this query, uh, well, we have to read everything. We, we cannot uh, to, to know the results. So what people ended up doing was just creating a concept of manual partitioning inside of these uh, directories. And as you can see here, well, they put just the date, a specific date. And then they put the specific hours of data. And when you do the query, well, you are going to re re reduce the, quanti the quantity of data that you are going to read. You just go a little bit uh, uh, logical, let's say, somehow. Uh, but you have to be aware of this. That's, that's the first issue. Because well, you, as a, as a data scientist or, or someone who is not the data engineer who is dealing with the infrastructure, well, you, you cannot know these things uh, in advance. Uh, so, but the cool thing, let's say somehow, is that Hive became the standard format for everything. It started to be supported not only uh, by, by, I mean, not only this table format was supported not only by Hive, but by Spark, by uh, all, the, all the other systems. And, um, uh, and the issue is that, well, it's not so good as, <laughs> as intended. 
Uh, I, I couldn't find a better way to put it because uh, that's the true. I mean, updates suck in, in, in this model. And one, one thing that you can immediately notice is what happens if two people are writing into the same directory. So you are basically in trouble. So concurrent writes was the main problem because it's not a safe uh, operation. This was some problem of isolation, let's say, somehow. Uh, also, well, updates were not transactional, and they had, you, you had to install a part of Hive, at least in the Hive world, you have to have a, a Postgres database in the site to coordinate this locking of who, is, who wrote, who didn't write, who was writing. Uh, of course, you had issues with uh, acid properties also when, when you use uh, distributed file systems that were not consistent. That was the case of S3 until like two years ago. Uh, so you were going to read, but well, the, the things were supposed to be written, but you, you didn't know yet, so that was another problem. And of course, sometimes if you really needed to do a, 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 a copy, for example, you have to copy a lot of files to other sites, and, and this created a, a mess because a lot of people are starting to create staging areas that make things even more complex because you have to track now this data came from this stage and goes to the other stage and nothing is connected, so that was pretty bad. And also, of course, uh, reads can be, uh, reads also are not so good either. <laughs> they can be better, of course. Uh, one thing is that this listing operation in the directory is quite slow, especially, especially if you have too, too many files. That, that's the real problem. Uh, also, well, the, the, the one thing that happened is that data became stale quite rapidly because, well, the, since the updates were so complex and, and, and slow, well, that, that's one issue. And of course, uh, and, and the last one that I, I, I like this one is uh, that uh, since you put everything in the same directory, uh, all these cloud storage tend to hash this first uh, part of the name of the directory to distribute the data internally. So if you are using the same, sometimes you, your data was not really distributed, so it's probably better to have different, different paths, let's say somehow like the previous part of the path. Uh, so, with all these issues, also there was also some other issues, as I mentioned, when you use this Hive table model, uh, you had to be aware of some things. And also the statistics were not really updated, they were like somehow, not say optional, but I mean, the, since all, all was complicated for updates, well, the, the, the metadata all, all, also was not updated. Uh, so. We were in the quest for a better table format, so that solved many of these issues. Well, we had assets, properties, we have proper updates and absurds, we support that we support concurrent writers, all the, all the issues. Uh, but also, well, that, that has the same advantages that Hive had, that uh, is the fact of having an open specification and being able to be supported by many of the, of the systems in the, in the big data world and in the data in general world. Uh, but uh, also it would be nice, nice if we could improve some things, like uh, the evolution of this uh, table somehow, so we can track what happened with the schemas of the table, what's going on, we created a new column, and, and when this happened, for example. If we can track uh, also um, or changes in general to the tables, or like write uh, appends that happened to them, and as a consequence of this design, well, that we could go back into other versions of the of the table, like uh, this concept of time travel or even rollback, let's say, somehow. Uh, and of course, kind of hide this complexity of leaky abstractions and, and partitioning and all these things that, well, as a user, you don't care about this, no? You, you are just, just want to analyze the data, you just want to run your, your training algorithm or, or you want to extract some features. You don't care about all these internal details, no? Um, so we had the solution, finally, we have a, a, a single standard for this, but no, <laughs> this is what happened. Uh, three different companies were dealing with this problem and three different solutions came out of it. Uh, Databricks produced Delta Lake that is, uh, was afterwards donated to the Linux Server Foundation, that's why this, this conference. Uh, and then it's Apache Iceberg who was created at, um, at Uber. And, and then there's Apache Hoodie also. Uh, sorry, at Netflix, uh, my, my mistake. And then there's an Apache Hoodie who was created at Uber. Uh, and all of the three are trying to solve the problem, all of the three with a different approach, and all of the three with different properties and levels of support. So it's kind of not yet a 100% clear moment to say who is winning this, this battle. 
Uh, so we ended up in this kind of scarcity situation no? when, when we have uh, more standards. We, we are looking for one unified standard. We come from the unified standard that was Hive, and now we are, we are getting into an extra standard. Let's say it's not the, it's not the, it's not the exact case from here that they're proposing a new standard that replaces the others, but three different standards arrive at the same time, so a pity. Uh, but how, how do they work? And it's quite, quite simple in reality. I mean, the idea is that instead of tracking these uh, directories, what we are going to track is, is a file. It's a file that called this like a special snapshot or commit that contains the list of the different files that compose the table and other extra metadata, like uh, what was the schema at this moment in time, uh, what is the current partition in the strategy, if that's for the case of Iceberg at least. And the statistic that I mentioned is kind of mean max things that can improve uh, SQL queries and other properties. Uh, and as you can see, well, this, this, if you are familiar with Git, and I hope so, because I, <laughs> I didn't think I would explain it more than this, uh, you are creating a snapshots that, that can be read by, by different people, or even somebody can be writing a new version, like it happens here in, in S3. So this is what kind of simplified view of this. In practice, and this is how Delta makes it, uh, what happens is that where we had the table bef before, now we're going to have an extra directory where we are going to put the metadata. And, and this metadata uh, is a JSON file that has the different, the different operations that, we, that, that are part of the, of the table. So in this case, we have two, two files, one and two parquet files that, that, that compose the version zero. When we create the version one, maybe we remove one of these files. Of course, this that does not happen at all manually. This is done by the different alg algorithms that we are running or the queries that we are doing when we are going to write into the next uh, data. Uh, the partitioning in, in, in Delta Lake is still explicit like this. In Iceberg, it's a little bit hidden. Uh, so that's the difference. But uh, let's say it's somehow straightforward. No? It re reminds Git if you have seen a little bit of internals. Uh, and well, the, the problem of uh, concurrency control well was solved also. Uh, and then when, when a user wants to write, just takes the latest version that was at the moment, in this case, the first version, and both of them try to write at the same time. The first one who can write wins, and, and the other one has to retry and then update the, the version and fix the problem by themselves. Um, so, how do you use this in practice? Well, it is, if you are familiar with the Spark, this is quite straightforward. What, the only thing that we, that we change is the format that we use. Instead of using Parquet, we use Delta, and that's most of it. If you are used to SQL kind of uh, systems, like uh, Hive, uh, you just define also that you use del Delta, and, and that's it. Uh, and also, well, the consequences of this is that we have more operations that we had before. We can do selects that uh, are dependent on the version, and we, this, this also can—I mean, uh, this is also can be done on, on timestamps. So I cannot only query version one, version two, but also query what was the version at this date. And this is—I uh, mean, this is from the data science uh, point of view. This is huge because now you can go and play with the data as it was when you trained the model, for example, so, or when you were extracting the features, so that's interesting. Uh, of course, uh, one, one thing we want to do, since they are quite similar, we want to convert this directory of files that we had with Hive into, into um, a delta or iceberg, uh, so there is a way to do that. There is also ways to optimize the data, and when we call about optimizing data, in this case, we have, as I mentioned, these files are partitioned, and these partitions or, or, or files can end up being of different sizes. What we want is to have like homogeneous, and well-balanced size, uh, and, and this, this can be done also well, by the implementation of this, not by the standard, but the standard helps to rewrite this. Um, and also, well, we can have like vacuum-like operations, like in databases, when we ignore uh, earlier data. Oops, there's a typo there. Uh, so, and finally, we, we have this log of all the operations we have done with the, with the table. So we can see the, uh, this, these different things that have happened. We, re, we added more data, we appended data, we merged data, we deleted data, and what was the version when these things happened. This is pretty good to follow what's the story of the table. Uh, so we got this kind of traceability. 
they call I don't, I don't I won't dare to call this lineage, but at least we have a, a way to audit the table changes. Uh, but of course, uh, as, I, as I said, there is more. Well, you get uh, you get zero copy clones. So now you have one table, and you want to create a copy just to make your experiment in the site. Well, that's way easier to do than before. Uh, you have you can if and if it doesn't work, well, you can go back and, and roll back your changes, and no, nobody's going to complain about your mess. Uh, of course, well, since we now have better statistics, well, the queries are going to be faster, and. Uh, uh, and also, if, if some of these systems, and in particular Databricks does this pretty well, is that they cache some of the read, read files in, in, uh, in their local disk, so they can, they can read it faster. And it's, 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 if they have faster disk, this is a good optimization. Uh, the table format ecosystem is, uh, is uh, relatively well uh, well, f filling rapidly with support from every every uh, different uh, project, uh, and and even while all these commercial vendors are are uh, supporting it in some level, there are also even new vendors who are really focused on on, on this. There is this tabular pro company who is supporting Iceberg from the creators of Iceberg. There is one house that is supporting Hudi. So. This is uh, this is quite exciting the the, the way this is changing. Uh, so well, just to a little bit of do a recap. Why should I care about this? Uh, well, uh, if I'm a data scientist, why should I care about this? Well, first one is because you can start uh, working on scalable experiments from the beginning, not just taking the CSV and and then saying oh I cannot do anything because then they, this won't scale. So that's important. Uh, other things that you can also start to think about data versioning from the beginning, like, oh, I want to go roll back or go upwards in, in, with my versions. Uh, of course, uh, well, the most important for me is that you can reproduce what your experiments do, and this is key. Uh, as I mentioned before, also, you have zero copy tables which is for, to create new tables. That's super, super useful also. And you can roll back in case that, th that things don't work. So that's, I, th I think they, they, they ones who are winning the most are, are the data scientists with this. Uh, what should I care about this if I am an open source contributor? So if you are working in creating data tools or ML frameworks, let's say somehow more, more in, the, in the tool side. Well, one thing is that there are new possibilities to create new projects for this. For example, I don't know, I can imagine if, what if I want to move from Delta to Iceberg? That shouldn't be that difficult because it's just metadata, no? But I haven't seen yet a project that does that. Uh, also, I mean, if you already have uh, support for Parquet or for, or, or for oh, I'm sorry, for uh, other all these data formats, maybe you care about integrating uh, about integrating this. Uh, like uh, now, you have to support the Delta. You want to support Delta because you saw all the advantages that it has, and because more and more companies are are starting to move into that. And of course, because of the performance improvements that you can get from from those, no, from having faster information. And this, in the end, is the, I think, is the, is the real rise of the lake house, as they call it, a strange term. Uh, the idea here is that we have uh, this in the middle uh, set of, uh, let's say, common data uh, stored in a cloud object storage. And then you put any tool that you see fit to process this data, to read it, to write it. So, so with the flexibility of being in a, in, a, in a distributed file system so you can put whatever you want into, you are not tied to the, to the implementer, let's say, like, uh, like uh, it happens with uh, a, a data warehouse, no? If you are in, in BigQuery or Snowflake, well, you don't know what's, where is your data and how, do you, how can you take the, your data in time. This at least is all open, all the specifications are there, you can just uh, use it because the tools are also open, so, so for me it's a big, a big thing. Uh, so what's next? <clears throat> and then the first question that comes, of course, is which format will become the standard? And, and I'm pretty pessimistic about this today. I mean, <laughs> I, I used to be more optimistic, than, uh, I mean, because the Databricks, of course, is pushing a lot uh, Delta Lake, and I would say that is the more user-friendly format of the tree right now. If you want to use it, it's what you can go straight with. Uh, Iceberg, in, in my opinion, is, is well well advanced in, in many in many aspects. 
Uh, and, and, there is, and it seems, of course, and there is all this commercial competition. Just one or two weeks ago, Snowflake said that they are going to support more of icebergs. So, uh, so they are not probably are not to, going to end up with a single standard, but with two, maybe. I have to be honest, I don't follow who did that close, so I don't know how is the current status of, of this. Uh, of course, as you can see, see well, we, sometimes we do strange design decisions, like when the Hive guys decided to use a directory for this. Uh, well, maybe maybe also the same will happen with these formats. No, uh, there are things that still can be improved. And, and for example, uh, as Iceberg, the first version of Iceberg, didn't support deletes. Uh, that was fixed in the version two. That's the current one that everybody uses. So don't worry about that. But now they are adding support for some security features in, in version three. And in, in the case of Delta, also there are like new 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 things coming uh, with the different releases. Like I, I remember so, something about column renames that were not supported. Um, of course, uh, if once we have this, uh, the first step, the next step is to have Git-like semantics of our data, and there are tools who, for and projects that are being grown on, around this, the project Nessie and, and LakeFS, both are open source. And the idea is that they, they want, now you, you, they, you want to have like, um, like a little bit more advanced of Git semantics, like with a tool, you know, to do Git uh, branch of this, uh, this version of the table. and. It's interesting and definitely the, uh, an area to watch closely. Um, of course, adoption is going fast. I, m most of the people who already had a data lake saw the advantage of this and ha are, are moving if they have not yet done it. And the next step for me is more um, growth of the ecosystem in the um, more local point of view, like more languages support for this, the, this kind of tools that everybody uses every day that they support these formats. This is still also ongoing. Um, in case someone of you want just to check, uh, go deeper into this, well, I already uploaded the slides. There are like uh, more, more in detail presentations of what I just highly mentioned, like in a higher level, let's say. Um, I think that's all for me. So in case there are some questions or others. Mm, yeah. And there is a question. Oh, it just has the microphone, I think. Uh, oh. yeah, okay. I'm kind of curious, like how you think about it in terms of, um, like mitigating some of the initial concerns that you might have about like adding an extra dimension to your to the data that you're storing, right? Of this version history, like, do you think that in all cases it makes perfect sense to kind of keep like a, a full transaction log of the entire history of the table, or I, do you I think there's like a, a trade-off there that needs yeah. to be considered? Yeah, I think I think that's that's the that's a good question. Just want to repeat, just to see if I got, got it. Uh, the, the question is if it makes sense to, for example, have a so complete traceability of the data. That's so how I understood it. For example, what is the trade-off of doing this or not doing it? Uh, I would say, well, the, the, it it all depends. No, it, as usual, it all depends. Uh, of course, this will add more uh, issues with uh, how to manage the stuff, and definitely I think there will be tools to, who are going to appear to, to deal with this. Uh, I would say, on the other hand, it, it comes with its mindset of uh, storage is, is cheap, so I don't care. Uh, and, and if we, ha we have this, these systems have like so called copy and write semantics, we just add in extra appends, like that's why it's called delta, by the way. So this is cheaper than before, so I, I think the tendency is still in that direction. And, and, and since you can remove also the things and, and then you optimize or vacuum operations, I, I don't think you lose much. Is there any kind of um, native or planned support to integrate some of this with like more um, layered storage as well, where you can have like older versions that you maybe are not as likely to go back to, and like go to cold storage or something like that? that, that that's a good question. That, that's <coughs> I'm sorry. That's, that's, that's curious because nobody has, as, uh, until before I seen, nobody's using these versioning capabilities of the object storage itself for this. 
No, but I, suppo I suppose the so next you're saying step. I could build like a multi-billion dollar company off of this <laughs> idea. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you, you, you can go ahead, yes. No, and also, no, but may, maybe somebody's doing, but I'm not aware of it at the moment. Um, the, the other thing is that um, the, it definitely can make sense that a new version of the file, since you have events, you can trigger the action backwards, you know, like, okay, I'm going to trigger now the, the vacuum or whatever. That is. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. And um, don't hesitate to ask me, I'll be around so.